Second first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your recap episode for this week's Charles Schwab Challenge. And while we are, I believe, waiting on Kyle Porter, he's wrapping up some obligations. I believe we might get a Mark Immelman sighting. That's probably less likely. I do have Greg Ducharme live right now. Greg, thanks for popping on. Hey, you can, yeah, you can lock it in with me. We'll see who else stops on by uh, and comes and enjoys the hangout for the rest of the way. But Rick, great to be here with you. Before we jump into this, because it was quite the Sunday, make sure you follow us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you consume your content and go a little bit further. Leave a five-star rating and review. Tell us what you thought about Jordan Spieth's performance on Sunday and make sure to hit that like button if you are on YouTube as well. Greg, it was Jason Kokrak who comes out on top thanks to an even round 70, but I kind of want to take this chronologically here uh kokrak started the day one shot back of jordan speed and by the time both of these golfers had played four holes they were a combined five over par not uh it, it was not smooth i mean kokrak leaves it in the bunker the very first time there we go there's kyle there's kyle um yeah but but it was a, it was an ugly start ugly start to the day KP, Kyle Porter, welcome in. Say hello to the people, please. Uh, I, I don't know if my microphone is working. I was on HQ. I didn't even have a microphone on. so I, I was been, wondering what was happening on that HQ hit. It's been a, it's been a, <laughs> you just forgot to I put your mic on? <laughs> yeah. And they always ask, like, test your mic, test your mic. Every in, time. In, in your defense, that's their fault. We do a mic check every single time, and I don't know what happened. This feels like speed throwing Greller under the bus. Uh, it's not actually. It's not. It's not actually their fault. Uh, but I appreciate. I appreciate you sticking up for me. It's a. It's a tough day for me. Tough day for speed. It's been a. It's been a rough one. Yeah, we're talking about the start here. Uh, Jordan Spieth goes out, bogeys three of his first four. Kokrak doesn't do much better. He bogeys half of his first four holes. And I'm looking, that that was the moment, KP, where I was looking, okay, how how far back on the leaderboard yeah. are these are these other guys? Because we had talked so much about this being a two-horse race, maybe a two-and-a-half horse race, if you consider Sergio Garcia. But that that really had me rethinking it. Yeah, it did. I mean, it, it never, I don't know. I guess when they got to like 12 or 13 and Charlie Hoffman was at 10, you're like, are they going to shoot 76 and, and, and lose? Right. I mean, it, it would have been, it would have been insane for that to happen. But, you know, the thing that we talked about on HQ, Greg, that I think is interesting is if you, you walk away from the tournament thinking, well, that was crappy. Like that was a, that was a bad, you know, Sunday. But if you flip their Thursday and Sunday scores, you walk away from the tournament thinking it was, it was the best tournament I've ever seen. You know, it was incredible. There's so much more hype or uh, accolades around somebody like a co-crack if you flip the scores around. Now, I get it. You can't do that. But that's what the lead is for, right? Like that's what the that's what the five stroke and four stroke lead is for to give you wiggle room on Sunday. So I don't know. I, I don't get I don't get super worked up about um you know, you kind of went to the finish on Sunday, but it, it does, it does just kind of leave you like, uh, well, is there another round that I can follow or is that, do we have to move on to the next one? Yeah, I, under, I totally understand where you're coming from with that. Um, and the hard thing is we all watch, it all culminates on Sunday. So we want to yeah. see the bet. <laughs> this is the, this is the problem with the, with the match play, right? The match play on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and sometimes even Saturday is the best, one of the best events we have on tour. And Sunday, it's usually a little bit of a exhale, a little bit of a letdown, and it's disappointing for that reason, because you, you only have two people in it. And so when you, when you have a two horse race, the outcome is dependent on only two people. When you have, uh, this is so obvious, it's not even worth saying, but the more people you have involved, the more likely you are to have somebody play really well. Yeah. The strange thing about today was um, it, it seemed like the conditions were perfect for scoring. <laughs> Like, look yeah, at but it. Think, what? But I mean, here's the thing. Think about how rare it is that we get a Phil Stinson situation from the open. Yeah, absolutely. Where guys are eight or seven strokes out in front. Now, it it felt like that was going to happen, but it, it's just so hard to play that well for four days. And 
normally you 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 don't get the two guys. It, it's just rare to get it like to have the numbers fall like this to get the bad play from the two from the very two guys that were so far out in front. But I think it's even more rare to have two guys that far out in front and then extend their lead. Well, it depends. I would say you typically will have both of them do it or or not. Could they you feed off of each other a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, Phil and um and Stenson, I remember them talking about how um how they were seeing great shots. They weren't seeing the bad shots that everybody else in the field was hitting. So watching on TV, it looks like the course is really quite simple. But when you're missing when you're missing greens, it's really penal. Missing fairways, it's really penal. Stenson and Mickelson just didn't do that. So they and all they saw was the other player hitting a great shot. So their picture in their mind is really clear. Um, we had kind of the opposite of that today, where um, you know Spieth stripes it off the first tee and then hits it way right on his second, and then Kokrak hits it in the bunker and leaves it in the bunker, and it just kind of gets to where you're. I don't know. You're not. You you don't feel like you have to attack quite the same way, and it just leads to like this slow kind of attitude throughout the rest of the round. After the dust settled, it was Jason Kokrak out on top. So after he bogeys two of his first four holes, he bounces back with birdies on three of his next four. He played much better down the stretch despite making bogeys on 15 and 16. He played just well enough to get it done. And KP, I think the story with Jason Kograk is going is going to be about a guy who uh, is a seasoned PGA Tour veteran. Right, He went 230 starts before he got his first win, which was the CJ Cup just a few starts ago. So now he goes uh, you know, 230 starts without a victory and then wins two of his next 17. Yeah, I think it's uh, – man, I think it's worth celebrating. You know, I, I think it's easy to – and this is kind of what I wrote about afterwards. It's, it's easy to just sneak your way around into these top 10s and top 25s and move into a, a world ranking that is just very comfortable. You just kind of stay like 33rd in the world and you don't have to, you never have to win, right? You just kind of, you, you can, you know, we, we hear, and I don't, I don't know if we talk about this enough, but you hear guys talk a lot about like, it's, it's freaking uncomfortable to lead a golf tournament. Like it's not, it's not, it's almost like not fun. I mean, it, it, as weird as that sounds. And so I think what he's done over the last, whatever that is, six months is, it's worth celebrating because somebody like Kokrak could just top 10 his way into retirement, right? <laughs> into a very wealthy retirement. And he yeah. has, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean he's, made, not, he's made $16 million uh, before this event in his career with one win. Not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not to go all like off Twitter on it, but he's kind of gone all in on, on winning, right? Like, and, and I, I mean that both tongue in cheek, but also in it, like, to do what he did against speed to win the CJ CJ cups. A, I mean, that's a huge event in terms of who's there uh, because it's a no cut. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not a prestigious tournament necessarily, but who you're beating is a big deal. And I don't know. It's cool. It's, it's kind of, it feels a little Jimmy Walker ish from 10 years ago where you're in your mid to late thirties, you start winning a little bit. You might pick off a major. Uh, you might get on a Ryder Cup team. That, that to me, is what I was texting with uh, Sean Martin of, of PJTour.com, and that was the name that kind of came to mind for, for both of us in terms of what, uh, as a career arc, who we would compare this to. The change for Jason Kokrak, Greg, is well documented. We, Mark and I talked about it last night. For essentially his entire career, he is ranked outside the top 100 in putting. He is seventh before this week. Uh, it is clear that is the one thing that has been a big difference for him. And he credits a longer putter at the suggestion of David Robinson. Not that David Robinson, his caddy. The Admiral. And the Admiral. <laughs> not, not not that one, uh, which make would make sense because he, the Admiral's a tall guy. He'd be like, Jason, get a longer putter. It helped what? my game. It helped. Did you, you, it would help your. Did you see David Robinson at Tim Duncan's NBA in a Hall of Fame induction? Uh, I did not. No, I didn't. <laughs> he's, lo I he's, looked the, he's looked the exact same for the last 40 years. Oh, yeah. I don't I think he's that. aged. He's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like a, he's like on pause. His aging is on. It's unbelievable. And now he's giving out putting tips to professional <laughs> players. Uh, the, the thing, I, I think, Greg, and maybe this is this is silly. Ob obviously, uh, 
we I think we should be crediting his hard work with the putter and not one day he woke up and after 10 years of being a professional golfer said, maybe I should try one that's an inch longer and all of a sudden I'm a great putter. Obviously, that's going to be the story that everybody talks about, but this is this is a well-honed craft that he probably had to put a lot of work into. I would say almost, I want to say everybody, but you know, you can't be so sure, but it, they're, they're all working really hard on their putting and everybody's trying to find an answer. And when you get a huge jump like this, sometimes it is a piece of equipment that changed and it just makes everything that, that much easier. And you get a little bit of confidence and you feel like you can make it from inside of 10 feet. And then you feel like, because you can make it inside of 10 feet, you're not going to three putt. So you can get a little more, uh, less defensive a little a little more aggressive on your first putt from 25 feet and all of a sudden things start to snowball and when you're really confident inside of 10 feet and uh kokrak at the beginning of the year i believe um or, or before this week for the year was 35th in three putt avoidance um, which has been a huge jump for him as well when you don't feel like you're going to three putt it free it frees you up it frees up the rest of your game in its entirety so um, and and believe it or not rick a piece of equipment a, a change like that really can light the spark of course there's hard work going into it it's not alone but it, it just it changes the momentum in a way that um that can be dramatic you get a new driver in play and you really like it. And all of a sudden it's easier to practice with it and, and it can change. You can get you really fired up. It can get you excited to putt. Um, this is what which, I keep telling my wife, you know, Greg, I just need a new driver. It'll make me excited about playing and practicing. Like, come yeah, on. Well, well maybe David Robinson can fit you for a driver <laughs> and then you'll be on your way to the tour. <laughs> that would be an amazing story. Uh, okay. KP, you mentioned the, the strength of field, or at least the prestige around winning the CJ cup, uh, which, which of these tournaments do you think is a, is a better win? Jason Kokrak's victory at the CJ cup or Max Homa's victory at the Genesis invitational. Like, what do I personally think, or or po no, points yes. wise? What do you What do you personally think? Uh, Genesis. Okay, for sure. The official world golf uh, ranking has them. The, oh, is that I why you think, ask? Yeah, I would think CJ Cup might be even higher. Uh, so, in terms of OWGR, they are exactly the same. Both six ten. Okay, strength oh, or at wow. least strength of the yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the tiebreaker for me is the course, right? Is 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 winning Riviera and Shadow and the Creek. history, right? <laughs> Tiger. What yeah, about Shadow Creek. Shadow Creek's no uh, no easy task. Yeah, but it yeah. was just well, once. I mean, it should be at Nine Bridges, right? It, it's supposed right. to be somewhere else. Yeah, but Riviera is like a major course, like it's hosted I know. majors. I know. So I I can't believe we're talking about this. Let's so talk about David Hogan's Robinson Alley. some more. Um, I'll find you some David Robinson. Stats how many, here. how many Hogan's alleys are there, Greg? Like six at least. There's a, there's a lot. He's got going to be like, I, it, they said they were saying today on the broadcast that the two most, uh, associated courses with Hogan are colonial and Riviera, but you also, I mean, Carnoustie has a Hogan's alley, um, <laughs> on, on the sixth hole. I think Marion Marion's got at least a plaque. I think you could call that a Hogan's Alley. Right? It's gonna, well, it's gonna be like twenty forty. It's gonna be twenty forty. Cole Hammer's gonna be winning the Sony Open, and they're gonna be like, you know, why I Hogan's Alley? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? You Did, he play, Did he ever play here? <laughs> they're gonna change the W trees into H trees. <laughs> Do you see a similarity between Cole Hammer and uh, Ben Hogan's Iron Game? <laughs> <laughs> We're moving on. Here we go. Uh, Jason Kokrak. Here's the, here's the bow on Jason Kokrak. He becomes the first player over the age of 35 to claim his first two PGA tour victories in the same season since anyone, anyone, so, so, you weren't even so listening. Again? I, I, I was know. reading. So I've got a lot going on. Uh, Jason Kokrak becomes the first player over the age of 35 to claim his first two PGA tour victories in the same season since Oh, his first two, the first two. Right. So you're over 35. You win your first two. I think I saw this. I think Justin Ray tweeted this out. Um, PGA Tour comms definitely tweeted it out, which is where I got this from. But Justin Ray might have also tweeted it out. Sounds like I'll neither just, of us saw it. This is not correct, but I'll just say Jimmy Walker. That is not correct. Um, Greg. I think he won once before he turned 30, 35. 
I want to say, uh, I would love to know how recent this was. 2018. Oh, there you go. There's a nugget. 2018. Yeah, it's a tricky 2018. one. 2018. 2018 really and won twice. Yep. I I have this strange feeling that it's Jim Herman, but I, it is not. <laughs> go um, Army. He won. The, early. Did he win early on? I don't know, but the the key at word here is PGA Tour victories. PGA Tour victories. Yeah, two PGA Tour victories. Oh, they okay. they won the. Because he's a Euro. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Francesco? Francesco Molinari. There it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see where you're <laughs> yeah. going. That's a okay. weird one. Yeah, that's a tough one. And he was over 35. I feel like Francesco's 35 now. I feel yeah, like he's right. like been 30 for 17 years. Yeah, he's just a 30-year-old guy. <laughs> I was I was letting that one breathe. I was letting it breathe because I didn't want to have to go to the next part, which is where we talk about Jordan Spieth and his day. It oh, was uh, a yeah. seventy three okay. where he bogeyed three of his first four holes. Uh, was somehow still in it. KP st still in it. Um, he had a couple of chances late. I'm thinking of the tee on sixteen. That's the par three to at least apply pressure onto Jason Kokrak to at least. Um, I, I, I think I said this on HQ, like try to get this pro speed crowd moving in the right direction. And he never took advantage of anything late. Well, he, no, he, he <laughs> did. He, he did nothing. I mean, it, it, here's what's interesting. So if you look at his numbers and, and I actually tweeted about this when he made the birdie on nine, he, he's been really confident with driver. I feel like ever since the, Texas Open, the Masters, he hit a great at the Masters off the tee. And he pulls driver on nine and he just smashes it where Kokrak's hitting, I think he had three, he might have hit an iron off nine. And Speed leaves himself 95 yards, uh, lob wedge to two feet, easy birdie. And he hit, he was fourth in the field in strokes gained off the tee on Sunday. And it was almost the inverse of the last three years where he can't get off the tee, but everything else is working. Sunday, it was he, he hit it pretty well. I mean, you think about the driver at one. Like, I mean, there, I think what Strokes Gain doesn't tell you is like the drive on uh, 15, where it's pretty deep, but it's in a bad spot compared to like where the flag is. Uh, and he just he couldn't work it back there. But his iron play was it was bad. And I thought he said that to. Dottie Pepper said it on, on 18. She was like, she said that he told her, like, I got, I have nothing today. And that which was is, pretty, which is not great on, as you're walking up 18, <laughs> trying to apply pressure to you, but, but it was <laughs> very evident, right? It was, yeah. it was very clear. So I don't know. We talked about this on HQ. I, I don't, I can't get super worked up about a single round, uh, as good as he's been for the last six months. If you're putting yourself in that position and you win, one out of three or one out of four with the, with how many times he's put himself in that position. I, that's, that's kind of just what it is. I mean, I, I think that's what all you're trying to do is put yourself with a chance to win it with five holes left in a tournament. And he stood on 17 with one down. How, how did, how was that? Yeah. Even, I don't even know how that was possible. And so on, uh, it, on 16, Kyle, to what you, what Dottie was saying, he said the same thing to Greller on the broadcast. I, I'm not sure if you guys heard it, but he looked and he, he hit it in the bunker and he said, I just have nothing today. It's not that hard a shot. It's yeah. not that hard a shot. And it he was it 170, was, Greg. What is he hitting? 170. What's he hitting? A nine iron? Maybe eight, an eight iron? I, I got eight. it at 183, right? 183, probably 170 front edge. And, they, him and Kokrak both hit eight. Okay. And Greg, he's begging for it to get over the water. That yeah, was that's, weird. That's 20 yards short of what he's trying to hit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the water goes up it, when you hit it to the right. If you hit it online with the flag, the water's not in play at all. But you leave it out to the right, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my God, there's water there. You don't even <laughs> think about that. It shouldn't even be in play. I mean, that's that shot should be 10 feet right of the flag all day. If you pull it a little bit or, or turn it over a little bit, it's right at it. It, it should not ever flirt with the bunker. So I, I agree. I don't think he had it today. And, um, aside from that shot, I thought it was a lot of distance control. Like he, yeah, he couldn't hit a partial shot. There was also a video of him talking to Greller. I believe it was yesterday. 
where he had 110 and he wanted to hit a sand wedge, felt like he had to hit it really hard, but also take the spin off and he bladed it over the green. You got, he, he said, I hit it in the equator. Oh, I hit it in the equator. And I think he said um, I hit it in the forehead on another I one. I hit it in the forehead. Yeah, that might have been the same one. Anyway, today he kept everything was full. He he tried to hit everything really hard. He didn't really hit very many. Maybe six and nine were the two occasions that were different where he hit little uh, chippers. A little, you know, he hit less club and um or more club and and hit it a little softer but he was saying i i don't have that we at some point we have to trust chipping a uh the one more club take one more and chip it and and if you don't have the ability to do that then all of a sudden your iron game is all reliant on what numbers you give yourself off the tee and if you went you've heard tiger say this all the time i gave myself really good numbers today um and and if you end up with full shots you can play great you end up in between clubs all day and it can get a little dicey because you constantly don't know what to do and it makes it that much harder to commit. And that's where I think Jordan struggled today. He couldn't choose one and really commit yeah. to it and and hit a, hit a distance or hit it 15 feet by, but just make sure that you feel like it's a good shot. So he's always forcing it and then he hits bad shots and now his confidence gets down and it kind of snowballs. I got a, I have a quote from him here. He said, uh, I didn't play well at all, quite simply. I mean, I could have, I think I wrote that. Uh, I could have shot even, I could have shot even part of day and won the golf tournament, but from the very get go, it was just a really bad start and then tried to fight my way through it. But I was really off with my golf swing. I really lost it this weekend. You just have to be in control around Colonial. I've been striking the ball beautifully this year, and I which is true. I just have to hit the reset button tomorrow and get to work the next couple of days and not let this weekend throw me away. That might, that might be a typo. Uh, and look at the positives of the, of the ball striking and look at the positives of the putting. It, it is true. Uh, so the weekend, he was a half a stroke better than the field this weekend. He was average. Um, now he had built himself up a, a very good, um, you know, a little bit of a cushion because over the first two rounds, he was, you know, simply better than everybody else by a pretty wide margin. So yeah, the, the weekend, not but great. This is, this is what happened, and we were kind of referencing it earlier. Everybody disproportionately applies what happens on Sunday or, or even over the last like four holes of a tournament. Mm -hmm. When you that's the, like that's what the stats are for <laughs> is to like kind of normalize everything that's happened in the event and not just you like not just look through the lens of the last two hours of of, of a tournament. And so I think, I think when he looks at that and, and for people that are watching, like that's such an important thing to remember is like, go look at the stats and see what the story is for the whole week. Now, Sunday does tell a story. Speed scoring average on Sunday this year is 119th on the PGA tour. That's not very good, but you got to look at the whole week. I think not, not just for speed, but for all these guys to figure out what's, what's actually going on. That that's true, but at the same time, sorry, Rick, it happened no, again. No, I was. Um, we you want to you play to win the to game, win the game, uh, right? Hoping, like Curve Edwards. You were gonna say that, <laughs> yeah. So uh, ultimately, we have to we have to judge more critically on Sunday, and you have to perform. You you want to get to a place where you perform your best on Sunday because as a player, it's payday. Right, that's the day where you wear the same color that you wear every Sunday. Right, you wear your black and red, or you're all navy blue. This is this is the day that's a little bit more special for you. Right? It's payday, you know. Yeah, but and, no, no, no. Hold on, I I disagree with this. I mean, I don't. Okay, I don't. Why? I don't disagree with it, but think about the way that Tiger won. Like, how did Tiger win all of his events? He he he. <clears throat> he get kind of found his footing on Thursday. He goes low Friday, Saturday. Uh, not all of his events, but the, I, I, if you yeah, I analyze agree. This them, is his, yeah. And then you play defense on Sunday, and I, so Spieth played. He played terribly on Sunday. That's not what I'm saying, but I, I don't know that you necessarily have to be at your best on Sunday in terms of scoring, in terms of moving forward on the leaderboard. But don't you think that Tiger playing that way tells you that? the purpose is to win. Like he, he's taking the stats and saying, I don't really, I don't, I don't really care what they, now they end up great, but I don't really care what they say. All I care about is I'm holding the trophy at the end of the week. And yeah. if that means I got to play defense 
right? If I got to box out four corner stall, whatever I got to do, I'll do that. <laughs> if I have to go low, I'll do that too. Right. So it, it just, it's doing what it takes to win. And that's what I mean by being at your best. I probably wasn't clear on that, but you want to make sure that you are in control of your game on Sunday. <laughs> Cause that's the ultimate you, you work all the work you do leading up to it is so that on Sunday, when you have a chance to win, you can execute and you can do what you want to do. And I, yeah, and it's, it maybe isn't there yet. And if he plays average defense on Sunday, if he shoots even par, what was the scoring average on Sunday, Rick, like 70.6 or something. I mean, the field average was like, even if he just plays the field average, then he, he wins 70.7. 70. 70.7. 70. And he, he, I mean, he played horribly. So I, I think we're more on the same page than it seems like, Greg, um, yeah. in terms of like, go ahead. It sounds like, it sounds like you're saying this is, um, you know, just a, it's a single round, right? It's not the end of the world that he didn't win today. Um, but I, I, and I, I can see where you're coming from. Cause I guess with the distance control thing I was talking about, it feels like his game isn't fully there yet. So I'm not ready to say this is like a mental block and he's a, he's choking and he doesn't have what it takes to win. I I think he does. I, I don't think he had his physical game over the weekend. There's something lacking. He's not trusting something. And he was put into a situation where he had to his weakness, which we didn't really know about until yesterday or today. His weakness was exposed today. And it had to do with partial shots and he was clearly uncomfortable with it and he couldn't he couldn't dial in a number. So I, I think it's more of a physical thing than a mental thing. Per Joel Beal, his Sunday 73 will drop him to a tie for 126th in final round scoring. So obviously something we will want to keep an eye on, especially as we get to our final two majors. Gentlemen, we've got to look ahead to the memorial. We've got to do our odds and ends, but I gotta pat myself on the back a little bit here very quickly. Uh, by my own standards, gentlemen, I went viral today. I had a tweet that for whatever reason resonated with the world of golf. And that tweet uh is essentially as follows: Mike Visaki, the the Monday qualifier from a couple of weeks ago, uh, the emotional viral story. Uh of he played, I believe, a practice round with JT this week, KP, and also apparently JT. Cut, a, cut him a check out of his own personal funds to help continue. I mean, mini tours are so expensive. Trying to be a professional golfer is so expensive. JT dipped into his own pocket to uh, to help out. Yeah, it's it's uh, really cool. You know, you, you are... If you're JT, you have a ton of money. You can spend it any number of different ways. And to do something like that, I, I thought... It's not the biggest deal in the world, but I thought how quietly he did it. You know, you were kind of the only one I think that had it. And I think that is, it would be very easy for uh, JT to kind of take the, take the megaphone on that and, and start yelling it from the rooftops, but uh, he didn't. And I, I, I thought that part of it was pretty cool. The expense, the, the mini tours, Greg. So for people who don't, no, uh, a lot of these events and they're all, they're all over the country, all over the place. You basically have to win them to make any amount of money. A lot of them are like $2,000 first prizes, maybe $3,000. And if you're traveling between gas money, and if you bring your caddy along or whoever your caddy, I mean, there's just, you're out of money immediately. Uh, it, to a lot of these guys, if they're lucky, can get some type of financial backer. A lot of them are living out of the same car or fr family and friends are backing them. I mean, it's really, it's really difficult to try to do. Yeah. It, and, um, it takes a lot of effort and it's designed the system is probably isn't the reason why it's designed this way, but it weeds out people, right? You have to, you're, you're put to the test. Do you have the game or not very early on? And if you don't have financial backing, you got to basically close to immediately play your way to uh, leveling up out of mini tours into corn fairy tour. You get to corn fairy tour. It's still expensive. And, it, but you can at least earn a living where you feel like you, you could play corn fairy tour for your career and and be okay mini tours you can't really do that the expenses outweigh the what you can earn in a year way too much corn fairy tour if you play well you you can kind of hang on the fringes maybe not for a lifetime but you can you can hang on the fringes 
Um, so look for this, this story is all over the place. Um, this story happens almost every single week. There are players who have a hard time. They're struggling to make it. They finally get into a, an event. They just don't all go viral the way this one did. So um, very interesting. But to me, with JT, it highlights the story, which is the difference in the game of golf and other sports. That guy's a potential competitor. Right? That guy could go out there uh, in Michael Visaki and go out there and beat JT in the tournament and take a trophy from him one day. And JT is going to help him out. And that's what golfers that. do. <laughs> golfers help each other. I, I heard this interview of Hudson Swafford talking about how, um, how he was really struggling and Lucas Glover fixed his setup position the week of a tournament there. I mean, they're on the range together and, and they help each other out and that's what golfers do. And I don't think that happens in other sports nearly at the same level. I mean, you want to keep information away from people in other sports. You're always looking for that competitive advantage. Um, but golfers are willing to help each other. So yeah, um, very cool story. But the coolest part is that you went viral, Rick. That's the Greg, coolest part. Uh, Greg, did you run into JT during your, your Brooks dealings down in Florida? <laughs> I, yeah, a couple of times, a little bit, a little bit less than Brooks. Um, he was there. He's does not work as hard. Would, is that what you're saying? No, he didn't work at, he didn't really work at medalist at, at medalist. He would go and play. So he'd yeah. warm up and then play. And a lot of guys did that. Brooks actually practiced there. So, um, I know JT was at bears club too. Right. No, that's just not, <laughs> it's just not true. It just wasn't true. That's not what I saw anyway. I, I, I like that. I, I like that. Greg, Greg's biggest beef with Brooks is that he won't admit how hard he works. Not that he <laughs> yeah, doesn't work come hard. On. It's like, just he won't admit it. It's it's almost <laughs> worse. It's almost more frustrating. It uh, is. It, it's like you're trying to be too cool for school. Like I, Rick, I don't. It's not high school. Rick, yeah. Rick, were you the only one that had that story? So full disclosure, this is not like my scoop here. Uh, they, I believe, it was Mark Wilson mentioned this on PGA Tour Live this morning. Uh, while JT was playing his round, they were vamping. He mentioned that he saw this at the, at the putting green or whatever earlier in the week. Uh, and I just tweeted it out and I didn't think much about it. And it kind of started rolling through. And then when it did, I was like, I gotta, I gotta go back and listen and make sure I heard that. Right. So I, I rewound it, played it back. And sure enough, that's exactly what I believe it was Mark Wilson. Exactly what he said. And I was like, wow, wow. that's awesome. That is awesome. So maybe I was the only one watching PGA tour live at. 5 45 this morning or whatever that was <laughs> could honestly could have been it could be <laughs> true that was yeah who could say uh, all right gentlemen we got to do odds and ends and we've got a big one next week as well i feel like there's a big one every single week but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners hi mark hello guys how are you mark sweet <laughs> mark I'm nice like, to have you me. nice job today this week Thank you. So uh, I'm bring, didn't get extra holes. <laughs> I'm gonna bring you. I'm gonna bring you in here, Mark. Here we go. <clears throat> and we're back. And joining us for the second half of the pod, there he is in the flesh, Mark Immelman, fresh back from Colonial. How are you? I'm good. And listen, last year this time there was not a traffic jam coming out of Colonial, and I could get back to the hotel pretty quick. But now. It, it seemed like all of Fort Worth was there this afternoon and it took a little while, but uh, great to be out there. What a Sunday afternoon and and just so good to see all the fans back. I mean, it seems like it's just gaining more and more momentum every week we're out. Obviously, last week was special, but this week uh, the fans showed out and um, they were very partisan towards Spieth, obviously. Uh, they certainly were. Unfortunately, they might have gone home. A little sad, but we've got a big one brewing next week. Mirfield Village. There is already a memorial kind of first look preview pod with Greg and, and Sia Najad and myself. Uh, but Mark, let's just kick it. Let's stick right with you because the big storyline of the week is going to be all of the renovations that were done to this course. Extensive. A lot of the green complexes have been redone. Uh, entire holes have kind of been adjusted. I mean, th there's the fingerprint is almost everywhere on, on what they've done in the last 11 months or so to this golf course yeah uh, i'm excited to see it i won't be there i actually have the week off and getting to celebrate my wife's birthday for the first time in about seven eight years whatever it is um anyway but i, I remember last year during the show they were essentially chopping up that golf course right in behind the final pairing 
You know, when the yeah. final pairing left five, the, the graders were there on four kind of thing. And it was crazy to see. And what was pretty cool was during the ad breaks, Mr. Nicholas Jack was was part of the, the, the uh, announce crew. And so he'd sort of tell us what was going on with the holes. And the one thing that sticks out to me, you talk about the redesign and all the rest of it. Look, he's a, he, he's a fantastic designer, Nicholas. But I'm looking forward to seeing what 15 looks like. That par yeah. five that you used to travel uphill, you drive it into like an embankment, then you have, have a blind shot to a very fast green. And what he's essentially doing is raising the tee and lowering the fairway so the hole's less uphill. And then apparently that stream that sort of used to cut across the, uh, the, the, the uh, hole, it's I gone. don't think that's there anymore. Yeah, it's going to flank the left-hand side a little bit more, I believe it is. It'll still be out of bounds down the right, Brass and DeChambeau territory, if you remember. And, and I think that stream then filters into the uh, water that's to the left of 16. So that's the one that jumps out to me. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I think they're redoing the greens, certainly because of the Poania mix that was growing into the bent grass there. But that's one of those courses, man. It's like the Mona Lisa. You, you don't have to do too much to it because it's great already. Well, I have the, the notes for 15 here. So that small creek between the tee and the fairway, that's removed. There is extensive leveling off the fairway landing zone. The fairway is now 10 to 15 feet lower. Uh, bunkers have been a new uh, fairway bunker complex and four bunkers between 285 and 320 yards are now out there. New green complexes, new water feature. I mean, it's, it's like a brand new hole. So it's, it's going to be pretty interesting when they get out there. Yeah. And look, the one thing's for certain I mean, think about how quickly they're turning this place around. Mm -hmm. and, and normally new greens are firm greens. And Jack likes to set it up like a major championship examination. And you remember last year, the rough that we had for those two weeks was just punitive. I mean, the first week it was thick, but the course was soft. And the second week, they just took all of the water off the greens. And it was the ultimate test. So now with some firm new greens, um, some new bunkering and stuff, it's just going to play hard as it always does. Greg, we had an opportunity to talk about this course already in that first look. So I'm going to just put a pin in you for one second and talk to KP here because Kyle, this is a, a staple on the PGA tour schedule. We go to it every single year, twice, twice last year, back to back weeks, and you get uh, an absolutely star studded field. So a lot of these guys coming back, going to be seeing these changes and using this as essentially the final tune up before the U S open, the natural rest week will come at the Palmetto championship. That's the, the new event taking the spot of the RBC Canadian uh, before they head off to Torrey Pines. Yeah, it does feel like we have these kind of tentpole events between the majors now because of the way everything's set up. You had Quail Hollow uh, between the Masters and PGA. You have Memorial between the PGA and the U.S. Open. That's kind of like the midpoint. I, I think, I don't, I don't know if I love Muirfield Village, but what I do love is is what Mark said about the way it gets set up because it does feel it <clears throat> like the, the thing, the thing that kind of stinks sometimes from week to week is that guys players aren't necessarily tested in the way that they are at majors. And that's not true at Muirfield village. They are tested like they are at majors and that that's fun because at, it, it leads to having really good winners can't lay and Hideki and Bryson and Tiger so many times like it just that's just how these things work and so I think that specifically that part and I, I I'm sure that's a big uh Jack Nicholas thing like he like that's he 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 pushes that a lot and I love that part of of the week at Memorial I, th I think that is um you know one of the best parts of that tournament to, uh, sorry, here we go. I saw again. you lean in. Go when for you, it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. when, <laughs> Kyle, you made a great point there because you you get great winners at Muirfield Village because it it rewards really well struck shots and penalizes the poor ones. And sometimes you don't get that difference when it's set up too firm to where it's almost unfair and you can't stop a ball and good shots aren't rewarded. And the other way where bad shots aren't penalized, um, you get it levels the playing field and you can get in both cases when it's too hard or too easy, you can get guys that aren't necessarily the best players. You get more unique leaderboards. Um, when, when it's set up the way Jack sets it up here, where you do get the reward from really good shots 
last year got close to that edge of being too hard, but where where good it shots so are rewarded, hard. yeah, it was real. It got close to the edge, but you can usually make some birdies out there if you hit great shots. You just have to hit great shots, um, and, I, and if you hit bad shots, you can make bogeys, and that's why I think you get that leaderboard. Well, and I, and I think when people are like, "Oh, does course setup matter that much?" Look at look at the two tournaments last year, right? You had oh. you had you had the work day, and then you had the memorial. It's the same course. It's a week apart. It's not not Completely only is it completely different. It's not like it's not like going from Tory in January to Tory in June. It's a week apart, and it was like two completely different tournaments. And that's where course setup matters a ton. And uh, it w- it wasn't bad for work day. It was just different. And I preferred kind of the memorial, even though <laughs> you're right. It was a little like, wow, this is uh, this is really, really difficult. But yeah. I think having that, especially leading into a U.S. Open, is, is, uh, is a good thing, probably. Well, it did last year identify, in my opinion, the best player in the field in John Rahm um, yeah. at the memorial. You know, he had played okay the week before, but... He's, everyone stayed there. He stayed there, got some practice in, and just was just so sorry. He was complete that week, and you had to be. You had to hit it really well to hold some of those greens, and and he played superbly. And, and you know, one, that's probably one of those wins, I think, that is probably the win on his resume thus far. He, he won by three shots, including that birdie turn, bogey, chip in, and then, Kyle, he gave us the very infamous – I can't even do the face. <laughs> that was, pre- that was, was pretty close. bad. Yeah? <laughs> Whatever you're trying to do. <laughs> uh, speaking of Tory Pines, because that's the kind of the, the, the next, you know, the next three weeks, that's our conclusion, Greg and William Hill, our friends over at William Hill have thrown up their hands and they have no idea what to do here because all of these golfers are listed between 11 to one and 14 to one. Here we go. John Rom. Dustin Johnson, Rory McIlroy, Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, Bryson DeChambeau, Brooks Kepka. William Hill just says, have at it. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that's fair, right? Uh, it's fair to do that. How, think about how many questions you have about all these guys. None of them are the, the guys that are, you know, like Spieth, who's kind of coming back from real struggles. You don't consider him. You better him... find a driver bus. He, he, he yeah, didn't right? know where it was going so today. <laughs> there's a big question. It's a it's was, a really big question, but Rom has questions, and uh, JT has questions, and D, they they all have big questions. So I I think it's um kind of a good way to do it. I actually thought Spieth drove it really well today. I I think that <laughs> what I mean he was he was <laughs> he admitted to Dotty Pepper he's like I don't know what to do he goes I don't know where this thing's going I might have scraped a few balls in fairways but it it certainly wasn't like he got over the ball and was like I'm going to set up and hit a fade over here the fades sometimes well, didn't fade I mean that's the thing St- again here we go statistics aside it's can I set up here see my shot and deliver what I'm seeing and and, and to me from you know, the little bit that I saw because I was just in front of him for a while and and then from what I heard, the commentary, he just he didn't have that gear. And you gotta have that gear in a US Open. I thought he hit it. I thought he hit driver well. I thought that his iron play was just awful. Just so I mean, we we covered this. Uh what I was gonna say is I was making the case that Spieth was the best player in the world, uh basically this year. And people are like, Okay, no, he's not. But I think that. If, and and I'm open to him not being, but if if that if that's your uh, stance, it's hard to make the case for who is. And I think that gets at what Rick is talking about with the odds of like who's the best guy in the world right now. It's not EJ, you know. It's not JT. It's not Rory. Uh, so I I think that I think there's a like who's the best guy in the world right now might be Abraham answer uh, is really kind of up in the air. It, there's just not a guy going into the U S open other than if you want to look at somebody like Bryson who thrives in, in those kind of conditions. Um, but he, you know, he was okay at the PGA, not, you know, he didn't really contend. So I, I, I think all that to say, uh, I think it's, I think w- where William Hill has the odds is totally, that's kind of how everybody feels. Yes, where you guys can help me because you keep up to date on the records a lot more. But for me, the one thing the US Open doesn't really do is identify the best player in the world on the week. It's the person who's playing the best. It's the person who's 
the most resilient. It's the person who hits the ball and play the most. It's the person that makes the clutch putts and such. And I'm, I'm sure you guys might point that out to me. But whenever you get one gets to a U.S. Open, it's that kind of thing where you know, okay, if I put the ball in play and I make some putts, no matter whether I'm the 50th seed or the first seed, I'm going to have a shot to win. You know, there was years the Tiger was dominant and, and Brooks was dominant. But otherwise, it's, it's oftentimes a free-for-all there, right? But that's what I was saying earlier about that line between um, too hard and and too easy. When when it's too hard or too easy, you get you can get some guys that aren't necessarily the best players winning. Um, so I, I think that's where you get like a. I don't want to throw anybody out there as the winners who. But you know, I, I'm the do first it. guy that comes to my do mind it. is do Michael it. Campbell <laughs> wins in uh, 2005. Huh? Right. It, that who one was in the final group that who was in the final group that day? I do remember that. I know who finished runner up. I don't know if he was in the final group or not. It was Jason Gore and Ratif Hussain were in the final group. Jason Gore, who now works for the USGA. Yeah. Wow. I think I he think has the, a great record in US Opens. Yeah. I think the counter to that, Greg, is like we got I think we all agreed we got a perfect setup at Kiowa and a guy that yeah. was two hundred to one won the golf tournament. Now <laughs> well, it's, it's right, a, but that's that open championship thing, right? That's win. Win, that's win, win does the yeah, same thing. Win. It's like soft to conditions today. Soft conditions today sort of, to a certain extent, mitigate ball striking skill. Um, yes. When you have to strike the ball well, but you can stand one up against a breeze at the wrong time or the thing gusts you and then you're cooked. And that might be the difference between fifth and first. So, so there's extenuating circumstances all of the time. But at the US Open, if you just keep it in front of you, I know it's a big golf course in Torrey Pines, but if you keep it in front of you and you're playing out of the fairway, and you make your share of seven, eight, nine footers for pars, you'll be a part of the storyline Sunday afternoon. I th I think the US Open has really just kind of turned into like who can hit it the farthest. And it's part of that is a course setup thing, right? Um, some of it is just the modern game. Um, but you look at the last, I mean, give me the last four winners. It's what uh, Bryson, Woodland, and and Brooks. And you have to be... You have to do other stuff well, but it really feels like it's just turned into like, hey, there's eight guys that can win this. And, you know, that might get proven wrong this year, but that's the way it's felt for the last four or five years. And DJ won in 16, too. Let's speed uh, one in 15. Speed oh, well, there, one goes in 15. My, there goes my argument about a free-for-all. <laughs> Excuse me. You can well, start yeah, I think you're one in 14. <laughs> play, play it at Chambers Bay every year. That was awesome. <laughs> That course uh, was all sweet. All right, gentlemen, <laughs> we've got odds, <laughs> odds and ends left. Uh, the the Greg giggle and the Doug Bell giggle are the two that get me. Uh, what, 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 what was the giggle for, Greg? It, you're just. I, I, I was going to say that's not a very popular take about Chambers. Bay. That's Kyle's I know. brand. I, yeah, no, <laughs> that's, that's what he's trying that to do. That course was sweet. <laughs> that course is uh, that course is incredible. They didn't. They didn't set it up very well, but the course itself is awesome. It's Craig like the most learning. disliked course. I, I uh, look. It, it looks sweet. I um. I, I think it may go back there at some point. I really do. Uh, I, but it was just fun. The way you said it was funny. I couldn't quite tell if you were kidding, no, it was, being sarcastic, it was awesome. or if you. Remember <laughs> Billy Horschel did that. It was, yeah, uh, it was a yeah, great I tournament. Hope, hope, it was. It was I a hope. great uh, ending to that tournament. Yeah, I hope they get to manage the Poana and the Greens a little bit better than the last go around over there because, jeez, <laughs> I heard some complaints that were oh, colorful. Yeah. yeah. Odds and ends. I love it when players complain. Our betting. Go ahead. Go ahead. Our Rick. betting cards. Thank you. Coach was a winner, but our big winner, the man with the takes, Kyle Porter, very close KP to winning every single one of your wagers. The one you lost, Colin Morikawa top 10 that was plus money but you cashed on jordan spieth top 10 emiliano grillo top 20 will zalatoris over scotty scheffler you didn't even have to sweat that one on the weekend yep. and your best bet the hoff charlie hoffman to finish inside the top 20 you didn't give him enough credit should have been a top five should have been, should have been a top five <laughs> uh, i was you know how you remember the losses more than the wins i was dying for Morikawa to get up and down on 18 because he hit it in that like little patch off to the left, which mm -hmm. shouldn't, shouldn't be there. It's weird that it's there. Um, 
and he he needed to get up and down and he missed his he missed his par putt. So one shot away from a perfect card, but uh, I'll take it. I get to play with house money again next week. You'll get them next week. One and done. And I'm going to try to do these in the order of earnings, starting with the lowest coach. What, coach would have been first no matter what order I went in. <laughs> it's like it, it's season <laughs> order or this week. <laughs> Sorry, it, it's coach. like you uh, you look checking your leaderboard on Thursday, Rick, starting at the bottom. Don't say my That's name. Right. Don't say starting, my name. Don't, yeah, say, don't say, my say my name, name first. <laughs> coach had Will Zalatoris. He finished T59. He got 16,875. And then, Greg, unfortunately, I get to say your name yeah. next and my I name as well because we both had Matt Kuchar. T50, 18,000. So, Greg, you lost a little bit of ground on both Kyle and Mark. Yeah. Um, to say it's devastating would probably be an <laughs> overstatement. Uh, I had a feeling Kutcher was going to play well this week. He didn't. That's why you kind of, you know, I didn't really know. I I, I didn't have Kokrak ready to go. So this we, is an unfortunate one, but I, I don't feel like I lost – a significant piece of ammunition going forward. So I'm, I'm hurt. Um, I'm disappointed, but we'll regroup and um, it's on to the memorial. Now Kuchar is going to win at Mirfield Village, where he's just dominate or he's just been piling up top tens. We used him. It's hard to picture. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's not happening. I, I, that can't happen. Uh, I'm doing this in my head, so bear with me here. Mark, you're next. You had Corey Connors T20. He got you seventy two thousand. He moves your yearly total to 6.936 and Kyle now takes a small lead over you you have dropped the third place all right cool I kind of I feel like I sort of skated by with one because I wanted to use Marikawa but I was I'm actually trying to save him for next week so uh, I think with Corey Connors I got away with a little something um I was surprised he shot over par today given how the conditions were because I figured he may thrive but you know, no, no harm, no foul, really. If you're finishing in the top 20, I think you're doing okay. Kyle did, in fact, take Colin Morikawa. He finished T14 and earned 125000 So, KP, you now jump up to second, $6.952 million. I'm I'm on the Rick plan of just I'm going to have to use, like, Stuart's. <laughs> well, I already used Stuart's Sink, actually. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I don't know who I'm going to have to use for the tour championship, but it's going to be ugly. It's going to be, hopefully there's going to be bad. I'm going to have yeah. to actually start making sure that I have someone who's going to be in it. Hey, just so you guys sign me up for Justin Thomas in the tour championship. Great. We're doing double points. We're doing double points for that, right? But we're, yeah. we're doing thought, shadow was leaderboard or was it triple? <laughs> yeah. Can we do the, sh can we do the real leaderboard? I don't know if we ever determined. <laughs> we that. should. That's what, that's what ODWGR does. That's what the, Jacob's on. What are we doing, Jacob? I got no clue what we're doing. I'll be honest. You'll Perfect. make up the rules every round we'll, over there. We'll, yeah. we'll figure it out the week before. <laughs> big, big you know. Depends there. on who's leading going in. <laughs> yeah, who's leading going depends in. on who I have left. Stay here, Jacob, because you, you, sir, were the big winner this week. You reached into your pocket. You pulled out a Charlie Hoffman who finished T3, got you 397000 And <laughs> while... <laughs> While you are still three million dollars behind Greg, you are at least distancing yourself from Coach. We're just trying to stay out of uh, the relegation zone, you know. Like uh, <laughs> over the weekend, we had uh, the world's richest match in football, as they call it in soccer, which is you know the one to get into the Premier League. So I'm just trying to avoid relegation here. And uh, the Hoff did it. We've had a good May. We've had a good May at the Halleck's household. I've had job well done. Three, I believe, three six figure. Paydays? Yeah, this your last five, you've earned 878000 You're on a good run. Things are changing. Uh, but yeah, we're going to run out of gas soon enough here because we're we're throwing <laughs> we're throwing the big names at the board here with Charlie Hoffman. You like, you that, F1, you, you like that F1 car that's got one lap to go and you're on empty and you're like... Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Lewis Hamilton. My tires have exploded. Um, we're just nursing this thing over the finish line. <laughs> or, what, or what do they say? Le LeBron James never loses a game. He just runs out of time or whatever. That's like what you're going to run into when we just run, run out of tournaments here. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay, gentlemen, uh, obviously for those listening, make sure that you are following us everywhere at first cut pod, YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff. But as I do each and every week, this is, this is it. This is the recap for the Charles Schwab. Anything else 
before we get out of here. Can you tell me if any of my bets actually cashed? Yes, I can. Because I had answer who was not very good then got good on the weekend. You pushed you pushed answer versus Morikawa. Uh, so you lost Neiman over Finau and Scheffler in a three ball. You lost Woodland over Harmon and Horschel. Lost by a shot, unfortunately. Yeah, you I lost the one shot too. margin of victory. Thanks, Jordan. But <laughs> but you won your best bet. That was answer over Justin Thomas and Patrick Reed. It was two to one. It was your best bet. That's the one you cashed. Dang it. So, I'm terrible. So that's okay. that's how you now you go on Twitter and you tell people you're undefeated in your best bets. I'm I'm just <laughs> terrible. Yeah. I'm give up. Ne- next time, Mark, you uh, you wait to ask that question until after the show. When we're <laughs> thank, off thank, no, no, no. There's there's a lesson in this. Kids don't gamble, really, especially <laughs> no, if it's yeah. your own money. <laughs> T- type it in the chat and then I'll yeah. I'll answer it and then we'll bring it up if it's good. Uh all right. Anything else, boys? Going once, going twice. All right, that'll do it. For this episode of the First Cut Pod, let me thank producer Jacob. He does all the hard work behind the scenes. That right there, that's Mark Immelman, who you can find at Mark underscore Immelman. That's Kyle Porter, who you can find at Kyle Porter CBS. That's Greg Ducharme, who you can find at The Real GFD. And you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the First Cut, and we'll catch you next time. 